Let's go. Uh, so this is the uh, the Affordable Housing Committee meeting of Wednesday, October 11th. Uh, we're meeting in the second floor conference room of the Old Town Hall, as well as via Zoom, uh, 7.05 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. And so I will turn things over to our chair. Sure. Uh, would you like to call the meeting to order and say uh, you're welcome in remarks? Great. We'll call the meeting to order. I think we've got a number of items to, to address tonight. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, mm -hmm. no, no guests this evening, so uh, we can uh, sure look forward to that in, in some future meetings, but we still have a lot to go through. First item would be consideration of minutes for the September 13 meeting. Mm -hmm. We have some extra copies if anyone. <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> They're all over. Needs one. Um, I had a couple of comments. Um, one is um, maybe a question. Um, uh, under the uh, payment in lieu of, yep. I think that that Randy Grizzio said he intended to touch base with you and Mark and Emmeline to come up with a proposal, uh, proposed yep. reg. He did, uh, and I checked with planning and zoning earlier today, and um, they had had some conversations with Chris. Um, so uh, following our meeting, but they haven't um, progressed with any proposed text. Okay. So I, I have shared uh, the text that we have discussed previously. Um, I know uh, Attorney Rizzio had uh, brought forth a slightly different language uh, to, to share with the committee last week or last month. Um, and so yeah, I just want to make sure that we're still you know, on the same page. Sure. So nothing, nothing is transpired. Okay. I don't know if we, if we need to worry about, I mean, I, I think this will all play. I'm not sure we need to add that statement that he's going to be. Yeah, I think a reg or not. it's always, uh, and I know Gretchen does her best to try to yeah, pull out the relevant it's points hard. here. I would just refer everyone to the, we have these videotaped now and recorded. So um, it's there for people want to look there. at the actual conversation. It is, this is a synthesis uh, well, <laughs> of, of what was discussed. Right, absolutely. Sum, uh, summary. Absolutely. Then also on the affordable housing plan, uh, the last one said that, that I had suggested that we adopt um, HTF regs, housing trust fund regs by the end of the year. I think what I actually was saying was that I'd like to see us uh, get through uh, some of the of the um, initiatives, some of the, um, depending on how you count, 11 to 13 initiatives that we had put together in the 2022 plan. And I'd cited several of them that, that we were focusing on right now. One of these was the housing uh, trust fund uh, criteria. Uh, another one was the inclusionary zoning. So after I made that comment, um, Mark had rightfully noted that some of these are multifaceted. Some of these, these initiatives are multifaceted. Some of them are not completely within our control, uh, to say the least. So I think the idea is just to, to make whatever progress we can make uh, by year end. So I'm not sure we need to change the regs. That they changed the, the minutes to that effect, but I just wanted to yeah, there's kind a little of clarify new, nuance. So. Yeah, the, the, the nuances that underlie underlie that. So um we I'm can... not proposing any change okay. in the regs. I, I'm just I, I'm just um just just a, a clarification of, in terms of what was so noted. <laughs> um and if we did the bare uh the minimum of what is actually required, it would be a very short minute. Uh, yes, because after the only thing required there, is if there's a motion. Yeah, I that's it. I understand. And, and, and <laughs> Which means the audio be nothing. videos out there. Yes, yeah, so could be who was here and that's it. The time the meeting was called to order, who was yeah. here, who was not, yeah. and any motions. And that's, that's pretty it. much it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any, um, is there a recommendation from the committee to approve mm -hmm. the minutes? Mm -hmm. Steve mm -hmm. mm -hmm. suggests uh, that we approve the minutes. Uh, second. Second. Second from Nina. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. When are you good? Yes, I'm good. Good. All right. 
Thank you. All right, so we, we've got the minutes approved for the September 13th meeting. Uh, so next item is POCD status. Yeah, I just, uh, I left this on because if we had at the last meeting, we had um, Emily and Harrigan, the assistant uh, town planner here to give an update as to where the commission is in, in um, updating the plan of conservation development. Um, you know, there is a draft that's available online. Um, it's uh, available for review and for comment. Uh, the commission continues to del deliberate um, and I'm not expecting a final decision this month, but um, you know it's it's and I know se several members of this committee and and um, have commented on the plan individually. Uh, I wasn't sure if the committee as a whole wanted to take a position. I would note that the affordable housing plan um, in terms of the affordable housing or the housing um, proposals, or policies in there largely reflects uh, the affordable housing plan work that this committee did um, in some in, with joint jointly with the Planning and Zoning Commission. So I, I think that's a positive that um, a lot of the work that this committee did in developing an affordable housing plan has been folded into the um, draft plan of conservation development. Um, you know, I, I know the commission was looking for feedback um, and just want and several members had said, you know, has this been has the draft plan been shared with boards and other boards and commissions for their review and comment and you know, staff has indicated yes, yes, we have shared it with other boards and commissions so it's entirely up to this group as to whether or not that's something you want to do, um, you know, with the economic development commission, I did kind of prepare, uh, well, I prepared a, a summary of the key policy, uh, key policies that had an economic development um, player uh, uh, to them and presented that to the commission for them to just look at and make sure that they were comfortable with uh, the direction in which the Planning and Zoning Commission was headed. And I could do the same here, uh, but you know, you can also, look at the plan it's it's pretty well captured in that one section that okay. talks about housing yes yes uh well in, in terms of where the um the, the um commission stands Heather's on. Uh, hi heather uh, hi me, how are you i'm sorry i had connectivity issues okay uh, let me just mention heather so so you and, and gwen are uh, uh online and we have uh in the room here uh nina uh steve um um uh, uh, Mark, uh, Jackie Page, and and uh, and and of course Gretchen, uh, and I. So um, I, I should have mentioned that earlier, but but thank you for joining us, Heather. Thank you, and again, I apologize. I was late. And no, no worries. So so the committee considered this at length on September twenty sixth, and it also considered it briefly last evening. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they focused last evening largely on Exide property and the uh, the um, center center district uh, area uh, definitions. And they'll be going at it again um, or at their next meeting, which I think is October twenty fourth. Um, they're not calling a special meeting yet, but I think they, that's probably going to be in the works after the uh, after the election. But they're going to be doing surgery to the to the draft as it currently stands. So one option would be for us to wait a bit and until we see where that goes before we comment. Yeah, or we could we could interject commentary. Not not required. I just put it on as a as an item if the if the committee wanted to discuss what was discussed. Something, and I think we should do it before it gets um if you get the term you use, but gets scrubbed. Uh, and updated because we want to have some input into that. But if, if other uh, committees are submitting written stuff, then I think we should too. Well, the only issue is is this would probably take us a good bit of time to to come up with with some feedback that we would all agree upon. I, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure we would be able to get it completed tonight. 
Oh, I wasn't prepared to discuss it tonight. I just so if if we were to do that, it might given the fact of their their schedule and hours, it might mean that we would need a special meeting to to do that. Not not that we should, but but it would probably require a special meeting uh, to 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 air this out. I was hoping that Mark had something that he had already written that he might distribute. Yeah. Do you have something in the back pocket? Um, no. Yeah. Just checking. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I could develop, you know, essentially, again, it wasn't all I did was take what was in the draft plan, pull out those policies that in this case would have a housing component to them um, and present them in bullet point form. And what we did at the economic is just go through the list and make sure everyone was generally comfortable or not. Um, and in that in that case, there were some things that the Economic Development Commission had discussed in the past as it relates to planning and zoning uh, that were not captured in the draft plan, and we wanted to comment on that. So it can take a different form. My overall, um, you know, when I looked at the plan, I saw a lot of um, similarities between the policies in the draft POCD and what was uh, put forth by this committee as part of our affordable housing plan. Different worded differently, but a lot of a lot of the same. So I thought that was a good thing uh, because it means they were kind of paying attention to the work that you all did and crafting an affordable housing plan, and they participated in that as well. So I think that was positive. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's worth commenting on that for the record, but, you know, I just wanted to give you an opportunity sure. if you wanted to. And, they, and there have been some references made to our work mm -hmm. uh, in the deliberations yes. so far as well, and, and not uncomplimentary, uh, uh, re you know, references to our work and positions and so yeah. forth. Um, I would find it um, interesting to get a copy of what the Economic Development Committee was working from that list, the sure. point list, yeah. and uh, if they submitted something in writing, I have to kind of pull it together now in, in a letter oh. you know, that, that the chair will now sign. The bullet point but list, it's, yeah, the bullet point list is, okay. and I could do the same as it relates to housing. It's not complicated. I just don't have it. <laughs> didn't, make, didn't want to go through that effort if it was not something that was um, something that you would like yeah. to, to look at. So, um, thoughts from the committee members? Same Would it be helpful or not? Said? I mean, I think, yeah, I think I think it would be great for us to take a look at it. Yeah. I mean, you said that they're already embracing some of the things that we have set forth. So I think even complimenting them at that fact, but yeah, maybe that's a creative to. Okay, I can. Have that ready. So, so Mark will, will provide us the yep. summary of economic development yep. commission and also draft a parallel mm -hmm. uh, piece for affordable housing committee. Yep. Great. Yep. Great. Well, and then we can we, we can circulate those and call. then and then get feedback and, and decide on what you know next steps that the that the committee would yep. will take. Well, at this point, it's just information. So it's a, it would be a summary of housing-related policies in the draft PUCD for your review. And, you know, the idea would be, you know, take a look at it. If there's something that sticks out either that you don't agree with or that you do agree with, that might be worthwhile commenting as a group. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't, you, know, you don't have to. At the very least, you should make sure that everyone is, I know many of you are, but I don't know if everyone has had an opportunity to review in-depth uh, draft POCD document, but it would be good to just make sure everyone understands what's in there. So before they... And then we could react to that. And, and I mean, Steve has suggested that we we provide a position, you know, a, a committee position. So then we could, we could react to that and then confer either remotely or have a special meeting to to address that, I guess. Yeah, I think you could just zoom, you know, something easy to submit. Do you know when RTM have they already commented on it or I don't I don't know if the RTM is uh 
is taking a position as a group or body. Um, so I don't. Who needs to approve it? Is it just that's the planning and zoning yeah. commission? Really, uh, I, I think there's a a process that the board of selectmen can take exception to it. In which case, then you mm -hmm. know, then um, they're not in an approval position, but they can note if there's something that they disagree with, and then it requires a larger majority in the planning and zoning commission to enact it. Yes. So that was just an informational update. The same with uh, number five, payment in lieu. Then we had a guest speaker uh, last month, uh, Attorney Ray Rizzio. Um, I had I have reached out reached out to uh, planning and zoning staff, uh, both the uh, town planner Jim Went and assistant town planner Emmeline Harrigan to ask whether or not um, Attorney Rizzio or uh, Attorney Chris Russo had provided any additional draft language for their consideration, and they have not received anything to date. Um, so I will keep you posted. Um, I think the, the big issue here, I mean, there's clearly there's a threshold policy question, whether or not that's something we think would be desirable to provide a tool uh, to the commission at their, to use at their discretion in certain instances provide for a payment in lieu option in lieu of creating units as part of the development under certain circumstances. And then if we get through that, then there's the question of, well, what is that? What is the, what's the formula? What's that worth? And obviously we had some uh, rather robust conversation uh, at our last meeting. Not surprisingly, the uh, attorney Rizzio had a different idea of what uh, the pain the lure should be the formula I think you know it has to be um, closer to what it would actually cost to produce a unit elsewhere uh, that's what the formula should be and we've done research in terms of other communities that have adopted similar language and some of the uh, formulas and the payment in lieu options are you know really woefully inadequate um, talking tens of thousands of dollars that's you not close come up with your multiple of the uh, well to be perfectly honest mm -hmm. uh, the last time this committee had discussed a payment in lieu it was in reference to the westway road uh, uh, project um, that condominium development where we had such and that was really a poster child as to why perhaps we should have this option because you there is such a disparity between the for sale market rate units, the price mm -hmm. and the affordable price. So we have units, comparable units within the same development, one going for $1.2 million and up, and the same unit is being sold as, as $200,000. Good for the person at $200,000. On the other hand, you know, at the end of the um, restriction period, that person could realize a fairly significant windfall, which I don't think was necessarily what we had intended. Um, and then secondly, um, people that are income eligible to afford a $200,000 unit, you know, obviously they have different means at their disposal in terms of paying the HOA fees and other things that, you know, the board as the condo association as a whole decide on. So some folks think it's great to have, you know, outside contractors doing all kinds of improvements and that's part of the fee structure. And uh, that may create problems down the road in terms of uh, it being sustainable for the folks at the lower income threshold. And 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 also, uh, payment in lieu of might enable us to to create multiple units as opposed to, you know, it if, could. If, if, if we could get two units out of that, it was a twelve unit development. We round up, so that would be two units. Um, potentially, we could get, you know, four units or 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 something more than two. If we were to, you know, you know, use that money elsewhere, you right? Get like eight hundred thousand. So, yeah. So the so to answer your question, Steve, mm -hmm. uh, when we were discussing that, we had talked about a number that we thought would be appropriate to, to buy out, and I created a formula based on that number, uh, and then did a couple of uh, quick, you know, analysis to see whether it would hold. Mm -hmm. And it seems to, you know, 
both then and, and now seems to produce a high enough number that I feel like we're getting good value for, for that. Well, I thought it was a good number and I, I liked, I thought the math was good and, and very easy to understand. Yep. And uh, my only concern was, and I guess you've checked it, that if, um, does it stay accurate as time passes? And so if the income doesn't go up really, but prices go up, you know, we have 10 percent inflation, 9 percent inflation. There is always that possibility of a disconnect. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have seen housing prices go up faster than incomes. So mm -hmm. it's it's not, um, you know, I looked at it a couple of years, but didn't do a full depth yeah. analysis. I, um, you know, it, it's one of those things that could be adjusted over time, too, if we mm -hmm. felt that there was a, yeah. it diverged and wasn't producing enough value. Uh, the yeah. idea was it wasn't supposed to be an easy out for a developer. It was going to, it was going to hurt a little bit um, for somebody, because we didn't want people to clamor to do it, because our preference would be to create the units in mm -hmm. place, but um, in the event that and we weren't anticipating a lot of for sale um, developments that would be uh, subject to the inclusionary provision as well as mostly mm -hmm. rental that we're preoccupied with. So it does give another tool for the commission if they wanted to use it. So, well, Dave, you know, the Jim or um, Caroline, were they supportive of the formula? I think they were. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they I think they look to this group for advice and counsel. I think the commission as a whole would look to this committee for um, our advice on whether this was a good thing. But it was, the draft was limited to for sale, was at the discretion of the Planning and Zoning Commission mm -hmm. at their, in their sole judgment whether that was appropriate. And then we had a, a formula that produced a mm -hmm. high enough number that was somewhere between 350 and 400. So that that seemed like a fair buyout. Um, the, the two, you, I'm sorry, the four units at Greenfield, um, they're going to cost like four and a quarter each, something like that? The bill? Yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of that is donated, donated labor, um, donated materials. But um, yeah, when I did a quick quick math on it, the const hard construction costs are more than what we can what habitat is committed to selling the units for yeah. so that's that's why the you know the town providing the land for free mm -hmm. you know basically helping to shepherd it through the permitting process so that wasn't much of a burden but you know they obviously have to fundraise to cover their soft cost and any differential between the two uh, so I think it's a good win-win win all the way. And we were able, we, they did, but they, I think like all good groups, they use any opportunity to fundraise off of it. So um, we, I did, I did go to the Water Pollution Control Authority um, and request on Habitat's behalf that they waive the inflow and infiltration fee, uh, which is quite high. It was going to be a $14,000 uh, fee. And uh, they agreed to do That's it. The fee for just tapping into the water? Not the tap fee. Yeah. It's a supplemental fee to cover the cost to address inflow. And it, it's basically to uh, provide monies to the town or Water Pollution Control Authority to address uh, deferred maintenance, things that they should have addressed before because they have leaky pipes. Yeah. That's what inflow so inflow and infiltration yeah. is. It's leaky pipes. It's pipes that are allowing uh, water to get into the system that then have to be treated. So the idea is to take that out so you don't have to treat um, you know water that doesn't need to be treated. So it was a it's a fee, and they charge a fee for any de new development. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the the staff said, well, you could ask for a waiver. They never granted it, but. I said, well, you know, nothing venture, nothing gain. Let's ask. So we've never asked in the past for a waiver. No. I don't know. It, it, recently, they increased the fees schedule. Mm -hmm. 
So it was it was a high number. Um, they have you know Habitat did pay the building pay the building permit fee. They they'll pay the the sewer connection fee. Uh, obviously the taxes. It just seemed like a supplemental. You know, it was just adding all these fees up. Yeah, which is you know helpful too to understand all the fees that the town yeah. charges um, on a development and you know the, well, the impact that that has in terms of producing um, affordable units um, mm -hmm. because all of it adds up. Yeah. So I know we've never had a discussion about waiving these kinds of or maybe we did a long time ago waiving fees for affordable housing developments not for eight thirty G but for mm -hmm. ones that the town supports um, and it'd be nice if you could get some of them waived and, and for Greenfield if you could let's say you couldn't get them waived or even if you got them waived if you could then have them set aside for um, a fund you know to uh, to help pay for improvements that might be needed over the lifetime 20 years or something um, you know just a renovation fund for the project I don't know if the town would be willing to forgo things like that or to help set it up. But, um, and you can imagine if someone is able to afford one of the affordable units, they don't have money for a new water heater or something like that, you know, just sitting around. So just a thought. Well, one thing at a time. But... Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Mark. So I guess we'll plan to. Yeah, there's some of these. We'll keep you updated as uh, things. I don't expect anything to happen. Uh, Did we November, submit so. that to? Um, to they have a copy of our draft language. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, have we recommended? We have not formally submitted. I think how we left the meeting was that I believe what's my understanding is how this is going to transpire is. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Russo and Ray Rizzio are representing the project at 250 Pequot. I think mm -hmm. as part of that, they're going to make a, a text amendment, a proposed text amendment change as part of the application packet. And I'm okay with their doing that just so that we have, well, we would have opportunity to review and comment upon that. So I think the, the purpose of his attendance at our last meeting was to make sure that we were at least receptive to the idea before he mm -hmm. went forward. And then we would make uh, amendment changes. Yeah, I think what we would do is, like anything else, we would take a look at his proposed language. And if we didn't like something, we would provide mm -hmm. comments to planning and zoning as part of their public hearing process and recommend they make some changes. There was a discussion at the last meeting among Emmeline, you, um, Ray, Rizzio, and maybe some of us about how this mechanism would work, uh, whether there would be a formal recommendation coming from affordable housing, whether it actually be helpful based upon the 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 law that the that planning and zoning has to follow. In other words, that might be helpful for them to have a recommendation that they act upon as opposed to exercising um, discretion. So I don't know how that all plays out, but but um, I assume that all come out in the wash, but. There was that conversation. Uh, misery likes company, so they <laughs> want to make sure that everyone else is on on board with the idea. Um, so I, I, you know, if the the commission, uh, this committee wants to play that role, I think we can make sure that that's part of the mm -hmm. part of the next uh, proposed text so, change. Um, are we also going to consider all site units? Well, they we didn't talk about that specifically, but that would be another option, mm -hmm. which has been you know talked about. I'm in in that same context of Westway, uh, when the payment in lieu option uh, seemed a dead end, there was then the conversation of offering other units in trade. I think we were at uh, if memory serves. I think we had like seven units for two. Um, now the seven units, uh, I think only one or two of the units were actually in the same zip code or geographic mm -hmm. vicinity as the original two. And that was part of the um, 
reluctance in the part of planning and zoning to adopt it. They didn't value the five units on the eastern side of town the same as, rightfully so, the same as the units in Southport. So, in any event, they didn't they didn't go through it. But that's that's even more complicated to come up with. What's the equivalent offsite? Is it a one for one? In that case, he was proposing more than two for one uh, as a as an option. So I I like more. Yeah. I like yeah. the seven units because for me uh, that's you know, more is better. <laughs> and negotiation. I agree. I agree, Mark. <laughs> more is better. <laughs> the West by units. I don't think they're affordable. I don't know what scam is being played over there. Well, I think they they clearly they sold. Uh, at least the one definitely sold at the affordable sales price uh, to to his father, I think, or something. Yeah. So I would, you know, I think we brought this up. It's um, to uh, the town attorney. The, the, I believe the town attorney is pursuing uh, this claim in court, as I understand it, because um, I've been. Yes. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. It's they filed a, a complaint. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, part of it is there was, in terms of doing, and this is something the affordable housing plan has discussed. We've talked about it. You know, all these affordability plans reference a administrator. There's no qualifications for those administrator. We don't have a vetted list of approved administrators. We've talked about creating one uh, because, you know, they're not all created equal. Some are uh, much better at following the rules and administering the plan appropriately and making sure that the individuals are income eligible and they're doing that income eligibility determination properly. And I'm not even saying that it's all people are trying to cook the books or doing it for nefarious reasons. They just may not they don't do it, so a it's a specialty, and so I I think there that might be something we want to look at too. Um, some communities do have a list of, of administrators that uh, you have to use, and from a enforcement standpoint, it would make it easier uh, for you know not that that's a primary concern, but uh, it would make it easier for this office, my office, to do it because. We do we do review the annual reports, and if I see something that doesn't look right, I call them out, or have planning and zoning call them out and ask for an explanation. And we've um, in this last go round, we return money to uh, tenants uh, because um, they were charging the wrong rent. So, um, and that was an innocent mistake. I'm just saying, and that was a property management firm that manages thousands of units. So it's, um, it can happen, but we also have people that are kind of like, they do it themselves, so they really don't know what they're doing. And um, it, it, it will be an issue the more of these developments are created. Right now we have like 12 annual reports when we get double that. Um, and I've said, you know, with the Fair Rent Commission coming online, my office can't staff it at this point. It's becoming so, at a point where we need to have some additional um, staff resources to cover these things. Would it make sense for another fee um, yeah. <laughs> to do like a fee from all of these different developments to pay for a person to... Well, that's one one possibility yeah, too. Yeah, because I just think if if we have a list of people, I'm always thinking of corruption. That's like where my head goes. Like, well, you'd have yeah, you'd you know have I mean? like it's yeah. gonna be like these people who yeah. are the ones who are always checking. Yep. Something can happen. We have the list. It's people that they know, as opposed to like an employee who does it for. No, you would still people. have to the employee. Yeah. The employee would still have to review the annual reports. I'm just suggesting that the administrator of the plan, the individual that's responsible for doing the income eligibility income determination policies. and setting the rent rental rates is, and we would go through a 
bidding process and probably have more than one. I'm assuming that's how they do it. They would just RFQ, you'd look at a list of qualifications uh, for these and you, you can use one of these six firms that do this type of thing. Okay, but, like a firm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking. Yeah. And, and like maybe they could petition to, if they, they would, can't require that they would pick one of those six. That doesn't seem so. I it would require. I think it would require us. You know, other communities do this, so I think it would require some some change to our regulations, probably the zoning level. Yeah. All this is coming zoning. All the reports go to zoning. That's it's not. We're not in the mm -hmm. picture here, so they go to zoning. But zoning says. We don't want to look at the reasons. They sent them over to me. I said, what do you think? So I, I'm reviewing them. So we have a process in place. I, I review each one each year, but I, I'll send it. And then if I see something, I go to, I send it to Jim. Here are my comments. And then he pursues it with the um, the applicant. Or sometimes he just says, you you go, you, you take them on. So that was the, the one. Would you say that some communities require developers to choose a firm on the list? Yeah, that's my understanding. Um, sort of seems. Yeah, I don't know. You know, again, it was just there's <laughs> most of these, they're trying to do the right thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't mind working with them. I just think that uh, at a certain point when we get more of these developments and each one they're doing an annual report and it takes time to review them then go back and forth. And then not to mention, you know, creating a fair rent commission along the way. So I have, you know, two additional boards and commissions now. Um, I said to the RTM when they created it, you know, I'm happy to provide whatever staff support I can, but at some point, we're going to need to talk about uh, staffing because I can't do it with two people. Yeah, and I thought that was the idea behind the plan that we would try to get additional staff yeah. for you. And actually, we, we talked specifically about this administrator uh, issue. Uh, Glenn had raised yeah. it, and I think he felt that we should have a an approved list of administrators that we went to so we would have confidence. Yeah, he was the one that was referencing uh, a few other communities. Maybe we just need to follow up with Glenn to find out, you know, how they manage it. And it hasn't, I've been able to manage it so far, but I can see a point. The fire marshal has the same comment, which is they have to do a annual inspection of all these units. Um, now, they have a lot more people over in the fire department than I do, but, um, you know, if we're going to do it right, and I, I don't, I want to make sure that we are, you know, minding the hen house and doing it right. So I, I do think at some point, maybe not this year, but down the road, you're going to have to probably provide somebody else to take a look at it. Maybe it's a part-time job. I don't know. But. Yeah, I hope it's this year. Well, I, I'm just, I am worried more about the Fair Rent Commission. I do think that, and I think the Fair Rent Commission will need, um, uh, Staff support from from a Can legal standpoint. Ask anybody to review. Um, well, um, the housing authority Carol uses uh, an outside firm to manage, and I'm assuming that that firm. Well, I'm sure they probably do something like that too. Yeah, and, sure. and I'm I'm just wondering if you yeah. could ask him what would it cost. We got well, even some people. of the firms that are currently managed some of these units, I have no problem with. They're they're very good. Um, but, you know, I, I will probably reach out to um, maybe Glenn and find out, talk to a couple communities to find out how they're doing it differently. But it's just something we should think about. Absolutely. And, you know, there are a couple, couple instances here where uh, there's a project that's nearing completion on Black Rock Turnpike. Um, I've been chasing um, the builder and his property manager for they're supposed to provide um, a fair market, fair fair marketing plan, um, and you know give us notice of you know their lease up, and they haven't done any of that. And I keep going to planning and zoning and saying, you know, don't you issue a CO um, mm -hmm. until we get this stuff, um, and same with the restrictive covenants. The, I'm not in the mm -hmm. chain, but you know, ultimately, I don't get to sign off on a CO saying everything has been approved. But 
the catch is better when you get the CO, better make sure you have the deed restrictions filed mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other things. So is that on the checklist? It's on my checklist. And I just make I just make sure it's on their checklist too. Um, okay. Good. Um, are, are we? Can we move on? Yes, please. I'm sorry. No, that's this is all good. Good discussion. So, so the next item would be discussion of the affordable housing uh, plan. Sorry. Um, and. There are a couple of things that, that, are, that are timely that we, we review tonight. So there are a few areas that you know, we, we've got about five objectives, depending on how you count, that are within that we've discussed as being priorities within the within the uh, plan execution for this year. One of them uh, is associated with with education and outreach, and the ADU seminar falls within that category. So probably good that we talk now about it because we had we had we had a tentative date of November thirteenth, and we um, we're probably going to have to make some changes in terms of the or may have to make some changes in terms of the of the panel. So Mark, can you? Yeah, here, here's here's I, I did check. Um, uh, so. We have reserved the Fairfield Museum and History Center um, for November 13th for uh, the ADU workshop. Uh, we have one panelist confirmed, well, actually two. Uh, Jim Fitzpatrick, um, who held a position at Fairfield U for many, many years, uh, is um, owned the house here in town and did a ADU as part of a refurbishment. So. He's going to talk about his experiences uh, with that. And then Emmeline Harrigan has confirmed that she would be available on the 13th uh, to stand in for Jim Went and talk about the uh, changes that the town has made to the regulations to make uh, it easier to create ADUs. So she'll be able to talk about the regulatory scheme. She uh, is talking to a couple of builders. Um, last last go round last year we had an architect Mark Andre, and we thought you know we'd change it up a little bit and maybe get a builder to talk more or less about the same types of issues, not from a design but from a construction standpoint in terms of costs, some other considerations that you know, and what that process looks like. Um, but so Emmeline is working on on that, um, and then the last person would be a realtor. Um, and last year, I think you, Steve, you had suggested um, an individual to fill that role. And mm -hmm. I don't know, if, again, I think our thought was we'd come up with a new panel, but similar roles. So if mm -hmm. we have another realtor that we might want to reach out to that could talk about what, you know, ADUs in terms of the value of the property and, and you know, selling it, that type of thing. And um is that something that somebody, Emline is not doing that. Um, so I wasn't sure if one of you were doing that, Bob was doing that. Uh, since he's not here, we can play Bob. We can try to find the one. Okay. It would be the one we had last year. Um, I wouldn't suggest we have the same one, you know, get a different person. Yeah, that's what, yeah that was our thought. Um, and, you know, there's a firm that has an office right downtown Southport. Uh, and I forget the name of the, of the firm. Sure uh, I forget. Oh, but, I know. Uh, um, okay. You know, would we expect Kelly. the ADUs to be more popular in the Southport region or in the university area or Greenfield Hill? I think they're all over. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that they're... But um, if if you would, wouldn't mind doing that, be yeah. great. Um, it, are we still shooting for the 13th? Yeah, I think so. The only person, the one change is that Bob was going to um, um, serve as moderator. Yeah, again, as he did last and, he, year. and he is not available on the 13th. And I think it would be easier for us to, um, given 
how far we've come, it'd be easier to stick with the date and find a replacement Bob than you know change the date and then sure. have to move on. Sure. I think the issue really was just, do we have everything else together? Sounds um, like it. I mean, Emmeline does not have a confirmed uh, speaker, but she's talking to a few uh, builders um, who have built ADU units in in Fairfield, and um, so she seems to. She said she would get me a name um, by the end of the week. Okay. So, yeah. and then we can we can figure you know a moderator. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, we don't need to necessarily talk about that right now. We can come up with a moderator, and then also uh, Mark, you would talk about doing a survey. Uh, in advance. Yeah, so the marketing, um, you know, last year we had issued a press release uh, announcing the workshop. Mm -hmm. It was on Eventbrite, so you, and it was a free ticket, but you'd register that way you could track our speeds. We had a full house, so it was good. We had a limited number of tickets. Um, and then, um, you know, we had a couple other means of getting it out to the to the public, but we, we can essentially refresh all this information and do it in about a month out would be great ramping it up you know two weeks before but the one thing that I had uh, mentioned to, to Irm is maybe using this as an opportunity not only to build awareness about uh, ADUs and the ADU regs and the workshop but maybe get some feedback from uh, the public in terms of you know if they were considering an ADU, uh, what what were the key uh, impediments? What what prevented them from following through? What are the what are their concerns or issues? And that may help us uh, inform the panel discussion, but also may highlight areas where we might be able to um, create an intervention of some sort to address those barriers, so that more people would take advantage of it. If it's cost. You know that would be an easy one. You know, from to identify cost, and then you know things that we talked about before is should we have some kind of you know program maybe funded through the housing trust fund that gives you know loans that get repaid at some point on very favorable terms to help people cover the cost of these things. So, uh, or you know, we people are concerned about you know increased in valuation. Could we offset that? through some kind of tax break or some sort. So there's, that was my thought in terms of putting a survey out. It would, uh, we could simple survey, a couple questions and get I was gonna understand. Say, can we tie it to the event? Yeah, thing? I think so too. So like yeah. if you sign up for the event, have you ever considered having an ADU in your property? Mm -hmm. What has stopped you from and then, like, Great so idea. then, yeah, that's a good idea. Like, and, and, and and it's like they, right there, and just like simple questions, two or three, so people don't get discouraged. And it could also be um, what when the the announcements, the first select woman's announcement, yeah. or if uh, if we have Bigelow Center or any other entity, uh, you know, announce this, we can just put a link to the mm -hmm. to the survey there as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you know it would be I we have a subscription to Survey Monkey in the office, so we could create a survey questionnaire pretty easily. I think we do want to limit it to like yeah, you know, five or six questions. So you're so you're you're, do, myself you're doing it like a lot a, of questions. Yeah, yes, you know you got to. You even say like the questionnaire takes two minutes, yeah. five minutes, three minutes, yeah. whatever it takes. You know, so usually when you we just didn't have to think those, about. What questions you want to ask? You know, so. I think that question that you asked is pretty relevant, yeah. and then we can definitely, like you said, some of those questions can yeah. be used for the moderators and for us to be able to ask yeah. questions of the panelists. So I think that question alone. And Anyone else? Anything else or other? Yeah, I like keeping it short, like you said, and, and that one question would be enough for me. You yeah, think? Uh, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same. Ahead, Heather, any I, questions I, that you guys I, think should be asked? I can also draft something real fast and make sure it around in case people say, mm -hmm. you know, have you thought about this? Okay.
Very good. Anything else then on the? No, the uh, ADU workshop, I think we're in good good mm -hmm. shape. We do need a realtor uh, rep for the panel and mm -hmm. to confirm our builder. But we have the other two panel slots filled. And, and you said either, fuel line was going to get an architect? A builder, a builder. We're not doing an architect. We're not going to do an architect. So. Okay. And I'm supposed to talk, but maybe you consider a moderator from desegregate Connecticut. Mm -hmm. If they were the ones that pushed the legislation through, mm -hmm. to some extent. Well, I, I would. It, this is really something we did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is really something that that came out of the Affordable <laughs> Housing <laughs> Committee <laughs> and Fearful Senior yeah. Advocates. So, I, I I mean, we're really way ahead of. You know the the state in terms of of ADUs. I've shared I've shared the fact that we're doing the workshop with some other groups so that they're aware that we're going to do it. And you know, you don't have to be live in Fairfield to come. But um, now hopefully we can also record it. I think we recorded it last year. We did, and then, uh, make sure that we can post that online. So it it is it's really directed to try to get people over the hump. You know, if there's questions they have, like I'm. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure about about this. And then they can hear from people that have built them, uh, incorporated them into their own home. Uh, they can ask questions in terms of what what the regulatory scheme is. So how that would affect the value of my property, mm -hmm. saleability. So it's really geared toward people that live here that might be thinking about it and to hopefully answer their questions and get them over the hump. So. Do we know anybody that's done an affordable ABU? No, and I think that's the issue that they're all they're all affordable in the small yeah. in the small A sense. The problem is we don't get credit for them. Mm -hmm. The only way you're going to get credit is if you have a deed restriction. And you know we've made it so easy to create ADUs. There's no reason to voluntarily deed restrict your property. Um, so unless unless you get something for it, you have to provide a benefit of some sort. So that's that's where, you know, if you are providing financial assistance, we do that. So mm -hmm. we we count those um, in our larger inventory. They don't count towards your housing unit equivalency points because they're not restricted for 40 years. But every time we provide a loan, to either assist somebody in down payment, buying a house because they're, they're income eligible or fixing up a house, we send those in because um, they're they're backed by a, a lien. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it's a promissory note. They pay it back when uh, when they go to sell the house, they pay it back. So we could do the same thing with an ADU. Yeah. I mean, it's something we a very, I, frankly, we could do it right now. It's just, I don't know that our CDBG funds are what would be enough, uh, we may want to supplement them because it's we don't get enough dollars there. Yeah. I mean, we, we probably need to have a separate discussion in terms of how we use housing trust funds and, and other grants to for multiple purposes, this being one of them. Uh, but, but yeah. yeah. And I could see a tax uh, adjustment. Yeah, yeah, you just have to, we have to have some kind of incentive for somebody to do what they otherwise wouldn't be would do voluntarily. Okay. Um, so any, anything else on the seminar? Anyone? Um, the Another one that I thought we might talk about tonight is, is inclusionary zoning from this perspective. Um, the, the PNZ Commission is grappling with should we increase mm -hmm. the percentage? And, and we were cited as advocating 15% in the deliberations. What percent? We were cited as advocating 15%. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever formally took that position, but 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 it was... Um, well, it's in both our affordable housing plan and the draft POC yeah, I guess, I guess that are so. increasing the inclusionary zoning did, did we set aside from 12% to 15 or did we say 15 Okay, so then I, 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 um, I, I stand corrected then. It, it, but it's in the language that says consider, you know, yeah. consider. So, yeah. Wow. So, uh, and, and then there was some discussion. So, so there was some, some advocacy from a couple of the members 
you know, can we increase this amount? And Jim uh, Wen did say, well, you know, we 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 have to be looking at the big picture here. What, you know, what's actually going to work on the ground in terms of encouraging builders to create affordable units? If we make that percentage too high, then they may not build at all. So it, it may work against us. So I, I think it's probably good for us to really do the math and, and decide among ourselves what we think is really workable and and um, and and weigh in with respect to the PUC review and, and and also at the same time address one of one of our key targets. Well, there's a lot of variables that go into this, obviously the cost of land being one. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, you know, financing is difficult. Uh, high, much higher interest rates, and that obviously impacts borrowing costs. And and um, you know, a lot of there are a lot of projects that people are going through the motions to get it approved, but not necessarily in the ground because they don't want to borrow money right now. Uh, but if they can borrow money, they don't want to borrow money at the rates that their banks are charging. So it all all these variables do tie together. It's it's a moving target. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I've been exploring with a few folks when we talk, they present into a code review meeting where they provide some preliminary plans. They talk about, um, you know, the building inspector says, you know, we have to follow this code and that code. But uh, part of that is, you know, under our current inclusionary zoning, they're required to provide 10 to 12%. And I've, each time I've said most recently, you know, what if, would you be interested in setting aside additional units, not at your sole cost, but if the town were to provide an incentive of some sort, would, would you be interested in having that conversation? Either to take the existing units, which are all at 80%, um, and make them lower mm -hmm. so that they're more deeply targeted to lower income thresholds or providing more than the 10 or 12% that's currently required or a combination of the two. And so I, I still think that that's a viable option considering it takes three to five years to get a project from conceptualization to built. Um, why not take advantage of that opportunity and get them, you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't be completely fair to put it all on, <laughs> on the private sector to do that. Yeah. Um, so we should have some skin in the game too. And we have a tool to do that. Uh, we just have to, you know, exercise it. Um, so it's, none of them said absolutely not, or none, and none of them said, Great, let's, let's talk. So I think it's gonna be a little bit of a, you know, I'm gonna have to get somebody to go first. And I think once you open the door, I think others will say, well, how'd that work? Can, can we talk about that? So I just think when we, we're gonna get our first moratorium with the stuff that's in construction next year. Uh, but we need to be thinking about what follows and if we can, tap into some of these projects that are in the pipeline, approved and ready to be built, we get more points and more units than what's otherwise on the table. I think that's, that's worthwhile. Well dig ourselves talking. out if we keep on, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a small number, potentially. I mean, these, the development that I profiled at this conference where I saw Jonathan was one of the TOD developments uh, over near Metro and you know, the taxes per unit are $6,000 plus. Um, so it's a pretty That's good nice. yield, right? Um, could we do with 5,800 instead of 6,200, you know, mm -hmm. would that be so bad? Mm -hmm. But it could, you know, change the numbers. And we know that there's, you know, every every affordable unit, there's a differential between the market rate that he otherwise would get versus the affordable unit. What if we just made that net zero? 
what's the taxes that the housing authority pays? Do they pay the full? They pay a payment in lieu. Okay. Yeah. So there is a there is a, a payment. Yeah, they get some break. And uh, I know that it's been you. It's been done for two. I, it's been done for Sullivan McKinney and I believe Parish Court. The payment in lieu. No, the tax abatement. I know for Sullivan McKinney was done. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's it's there. It's a totally different place, but the developments that I look at on Operation Oak too. Right. We were talking that five hundred dollars, maybe a thousand a year in taxes. Uh, the town wanted maybe fifteen hundred or two thousand. Uh, we couldn't get there. Um, and six thousand um, that's a big number that's a big number mm -hmm. yeah these are they are um, commercial assets um, significant tax paying entities <laughs> you know look at the overall uh, tax bill for these units it's it's pretty pretty high mm -hmm. when I shared that information with the Board of Finance it really opened some eyes because they uh, compare very favorably to other commercial um, properties here in town in terms of what their what their tax yield is on a per acre basis and a um, per square foot basis. You know, look at the numbers; it's pretty eye opening. And that's with affordable units in there. Mm -hmm. That's the average. Yeah, this whole the, the whole process, the the whole series of charges that we apply now. Perhaps should be looked at. You know, we, we that's the other thing you can tackle too. Yeah. We I mean, talked about the fee structures and you add all that up and the parking requirements that all have a cost associated with them. You know, 10 units, you know, you have to apply a, a provide an affordable unit. If you have nine units, you pay only five dollars per thousand. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a dramatic difference. In terms of what you want to pay with, well, there's that too. I mean, we, we we probably should be looking at either increasing the the fee for yep. or some sort of a, a more graduated scale that we apply to uh, in in terms of of charges, uh, because right now it's just it, it's it's really you know it, it's it's really a um, Kind of a disconnected. You know, are you saying that the inclusionary zoning fee is too high? I'm saying it's too low. I'm saying it's it's too low, and it's it's far too low relative to what someone who who builds ten units. So think think about this: you, you build ten units, you provide one affordable. Mm -hmm. You build twelve units, now you're on the hook for two. You build nine, you're on the hook only for five dollars per thousand. Mm -hmm. It's just it's 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 not it's not equitable mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the way we're treating uh, developers. And you know, we we set the ten. You know, the other option we talked about is reducing it from the th th initial threshold from ten lower. You know, so you could make it five, but you're going to still run into the situation now. Instead of five units, it's going to be four units, and not, you know, not. Um, so people will always try to find ways, mm -hmm. loopholes around it. Yeah, it can't be perfect about this. No, mm -hmm. and we, we try to create a, a fairly easy to understand yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. and, and there I, are clearly some loopholes that people are yeah. doing. And not to be critical at all, but what we did, we've done great work here. Uh, but but I think we could make it more equitable and, and also provide more incentive for people to, you know, to, to build affordable housing if we if we thought through you know, the, the, the charge structure. Good point. So if we put it down to five units and you had to give 10%, that's a half a unit? Well, we it's, never, it it's always rounded up, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of tough. It is. <laughs> you probably wouldn't get a lot of five unit development. No. You, you would get, you know, but... Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be a perverse incentive to create a nine unit development anymore. It'd be 10. Yeah. 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 Mark, you talked about the, the blowback we have gotten from builders about 
yeah. lower charges. And, and I, I get I, I, I get why they don't like the five dollars per thousand now. If you talked about some of these charges mm -hmm. that, that these other oh, charges, up. like sewer and whatnot that they pay, I, I get it now. But um, but they're they're still doing much better relative to the well. You don't you don't see people not building. So you know clearly um, they're able to absorb it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like you. That would be the you, if you create a, a structure in place where you know you there might be people out there that probably say, well, I'll just make it so that it's impossible to build. That would be great. Um, on paper, you can build, but you can't actually make it work. Um, but let's assume that you want people to build. If you layer it too much, you create a situation where it becomes untenable. That's not that's what you want to avoid. No, of course. But I don't, of clearly course. it's not. And the evidence is based on the fact that we still have fairly robust building activity here in town. So, you know, we're just, you, you just not, are not producing, nor can you really produce affordable units without some level of, in most cases, fairly significant subsidy there. Right, and also we're probably we we might be encouraging scale. With, with I don't think you're increasing. You don't yeah, think I don't. You're getting that. It's a good good question, but uh, are you making the units bigger and more expensive because of these things? I don't think so. I think it's based on the market demand that they. Well, I'm not, but doing bigger. More I mean, units. bigger bigger units. Yeah, I'm just saying, as a developer, if I find the uh, 12 units too affordable to be untenable, maybe I'm more inclined to do a development with 30 units or 40 units or 50 units because I can... Well, you have to work that within the existing zoning construct, so you may not have that opportunity unless you're within the transit overlay. So A30G, A30G is whatever. Or an A30G, in which case you're not talking about 10% anymore, you're talking about 30%. So that's... That's the conversation that the Planning and Zoning Commission should have as it relates to the DRD overlay that created a lot of the condominium developments around town. Those, the density there are more than what is currently allowed under our regs, but they're not out of character. Um, so the conversation is, can we go back to that level of density to recreate some of the incentive to do that? And then what's the offset, you know, in terms of the set aside requirements? So, yeah, great, good, good thoughts. So, so, so should, back to the initial. So, so is there, is it feasible for us to try to do some math? Uh, yes, yeah, some math now at this stage, or or do you think it's more prudent for us to wait and see how this fleshes out? Well, I think we could. I think we could try it. Yeah, we can put together a, a pro forma and see how it works out. I mean, I've played with it a little bit myself. So, so what do you do for financing? Are you going to plug in eight percent or something? You know, I have to go to the regular, you know, the the daily rates. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's. That's the challenge, but it's not going to stay at eight percent the whole time, you know. So maybe be higher, you know. At one point, it were higher than eight percent, uh, but we've also had a period where it was much. The cost of borrowing was much less. So I think it's, I think it's one of these things where you might have to constantly play around with the numbers just to make sure that you're, you're getting, you know, fair value. Well, I'm, I'm sure committee members would be happy to to work with you on this or do whatever legwork we can do. So well, Steve Steve puts together these things all the time. So yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy to work with you. Steve's putting it. <laughs> Steve is doing this. Uh, are there other um, other uh, provisions of the affordable housing plan that committee members would like to talk about? or guests would like to talk about this evening. I was gonna ask a question on Parish Court. I'm on the board over there. Yeah. And we, 77 units are affordable. Yeah. There must be pre pre the 
accounting for the moratorium. Yeah, you know, there are actually 100 that. units there, and I believe all of them are actually affordable, but the 77 are the ones that are financed through, I don't know. through HUD. And 22 are a market rate, but eight of those are up for transitioning to HUD, so they're being applied to get under affordable. So I don't know if that adds to these numbers at all. That would be great. Yeah, it would. So, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, and the goal is to get all 22 back to affordable as well. Okay. But, um, yeah, I would think. How can we help? <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. They do pay taxes, one hundred forty-seven thousand a year. Yeah. Okay. So I went to. So it, was Solomon, it was definitely Solomon Kenny, and I know Operation Hope, another one. Because I have been arguing with the, uh, it's kind of half half cooked. Um, so there was a, a housing agreement that was uh, authorized by the boards, but never fully executed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in our moratorium, uh, you'll see uh, a couple different uh, numbers in red, mm -hmm. because those are the attainable points if we actually fulfill, you know, I'm trying to get the legal beagles to write the uh, deed restrictions mm -hmm. so that we execute the housing agreement with the deed restrictions in place. So that they're actually reflective of the population that Operation Hope serves, which is a much lower income population than 80%. They would be at 40% AMI, which would be two and a half percent, two and a half points per unit. Mm -hmm. So it's it's small in terms of the number of units, but every little point counts, right? Yes. So, okay. And that's one thing that's on the to-do list that needs to be done before we file our moratorium application. Um, that has to be executed. So, I'm sorry. The uh, There's a, a housing agreement that was authorized by the board for Operation Hope, uh, providing a tax abatement of some kind um, in exchange for, you know, the fact that these are affordable units, deep restricted as such. So I'm, I can't, it was authorized, I have the mi minutes, the, but there's no actual signed document. Mm -hmm. um, and I need obviously a fully executed document and a um, restrictive covenant that's been recorded on the land records in order to get credit. Are you waiting for the town attorney or? Do you yeah, yeah. I don't want to be writing language myself. Yeah. Practicing law without a license again. Yeah, as long as you're talking about Operation Hope, did anybody? I love that parking lot analysis that we did. Yeah. yeah. Is any of those options maybe for Operation Hope, the land they're looking for? Well, it's going to be a long, uh, <laughs> long train because I think we would have to amend. So they're all privately owned. So we would amend the regs potentially to reduce the parking threshold, which would open up opportunities to create either less parking and open space or new development. But there's nothing to say that they would have to then, you can't say, well, we'll give you this relief if you sell it to Operation Hope at some discounted rate. You can't do it that way. So I think, and that's going to take a while to play out. So we're currently looking at ground leasing the former town garage at 488 Tunxis Hill to Operation O. They would tear down the existing structure, build new. The only issue that they have there is that the site is small and they're not able to park, not able to provide enough parking. Where the next door neighbor is the Episcopal Church. Um, they don't have a functioning church there. We've talked to the diocese and said, would you be willing to either lease or sell us the property? And uh, they're in discernment. They haven't fully decided that, but I keep pushing it. Um, so that now, house that has the insur insurance agency in it. We originally talked to him. He was asking for uh, fairly exorbitant terms. Yeah. Uh, they thought they had come to a deal, and then uh, he blew it up. Um, well, he blames them, but either way, it's not um, not going forward. So there's a couple of, uh, for parking. 
No, no. The, the structure. The structure they're trying to do ten thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. So this would be a two or three story structure. Uh, maybe it's on a podium, so you have parking below, yeah. two floors above, so 5,000. That, that used to be Kohl's, it's Aldi or whatever. Mm -hmm. that. So they've got that parking lot yep. across the street. Sure do. And The um, thing is, see. they've tried to buy property from private parties, mm -hmm. not getting anywhere. They've offered, you know, market value, not getting anywhere. So mm -hmm. at least in this case, the town controls this parcel, so we can do a deal. I have to get it through the RTM and the, all the town boards, but um, you know, at least it's property that we own and control, mm -hmm. as opposed to these other ones where we have to work with another party that may say, well, that's great, um, but I'd rather get something better than Operation Oak for that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not as many community-minded people there. Mm -hmm. We thought we had a deal in another place, and it just didn't. It, it we were close, and I don't know why he just pulled out. They were giving, they were offering, you know, decent money for it. But I so I had two other things related to the plan. One is um, uh, at the last meeting. I guess this relates to middle housing. At uh, the last meeting, Bob. Um, mentioned that he had done a review or was doing a review of, of um, I'm not sure if they were blighted properties, but properties that are in this, this repair. And um, he, he'll, he plans to have a full presentation at the next meeting uh, about that. <laughs> and he asked if um, other members would be amenable to, you know, maybe look in their, in their areas or areas in which they travel and look for other possible properties that might be added to this to this list. So I'm, I'm passing along Bob's request um, to everyone. And then with respect to parking, um, I think we had talked about the fact that the Mill Hill commuter lot is probably going to be a while. It's probably a longer term consideration. Um, and, and is there a, another nearer term possibility that we could begin to focus in on. And I think there was some discussion about the, the lot uh, opposite um, Aldi and, and floor and decor, but maybe there are other possibilities. Well, the difference is that the Mill Hill uh, commuter lot, um, town owns that. So uh, not that that's gonna make it an easy process, but we do actually own it and can have say in what we do with it. Um, if we don't use it for parking. Uh, the one at Audi is owned by a private uh, party. And, you know, I, it, I know that they have, they would like to do more development there. Mm -hmm. And right now the parking uh, is an issue. Um, BJ's, same, same thing. Believe it or not, <laughs> BJ's is short of parking, according to I us. I believe that. Uh, how? <laughs> Mayor Joe's, sure. BJ's, they got access. two decks, decks of parking. They have 1,400 plus parking spaces there. And yet our zoning regs say, you don't have enough parking. Um, really? Yeah. So because what's happening to the theaters there? They're vacant. Yeah. And it's a living plan? Nothing at the moment. Can so Operation Hope go in there? No, because they're not really available to like a lot of these things. They're available, not really available. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, we've gone through the list of yeah. commercial property, um, mm -hmm. and it's either way outside of their price range or just not available. So, uh, but the parking is dictated by the square footage and the use, mm -hmm. and so you know that large building you only see the bj's piece but there's other portions in the back it's all listed as retail and that requires you know uh like What's five space you know, four spots per thousand there's parking. besides bj's there it's the you know, bj's is the only tenant right yeah. now okay. but yeah, the other other tenants 
that cinemas actually occupy owned so it was kind of 160,000 square feet. The cinemas did not just make up 160,000. There was buildings in the back that were never used except for storage. There's a whole uh, first level of 40,000 square feet that's just raw space, never, never used. So all that was classified as retail because of the high parking count. And so you add up like 300,000 square feet times, you know, those requirements. And you, uh, you say, well, you need 1,600 parking space. You only have 1,498. <laughs> so you need, you're short. <laughs> In reality, it makes no sense. No. Yeah. Sure. So I think parking is a good one. Mill Hill commuter lot, it would take a while. Mm -hmm. But starting to have the conversation, it's going to take a little bit of time. So and then other other properties, I think what Bob, we've looked around, you know, there are other, there may be properties in your neighborhood that look a little run down. Maybe it's a, this is what developers do. Um, they drive around and see a kind of property that looks a little run down, ragged around the edges and they approach the owner. If the owner's like been there for you know, 50 years, maybe looking to sell, that's mm -hmm. how it happens. So. You know, we might be able to identify those properties ourselves and you know, we all live in a neighborhood we can see that and you know maybe we can have a conversation with some folks it's not we're not forcing anyone to do anything but if they're thinking about selling maybe we can be one of the first ones to talk to them about it or one of our partners like habitat or operation hope or somebody like that so i think that would be worthwhile in um something we can talk about okay great uh anything else on the plan objectives mm -hmm. um so do we have a list of the the two or three or four priorities that we're focusing on this year they are um they were uh, inclusionary zoning uh supporting fha mm -hmm. uh middle housing mm -hmm. Uh, the housing trust fund um, guidelines and uh, education and outreach. So that those those were the five. And do you think that's too many? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it depends on how many years we we want to take to, to complete the plan. <laughs> well, I'm uh, thinking that like if we could focus like on a year basis, right. This year, there may be one or two that we focus on, and next year, one or two. So it's a longer discussion. We can do it next month or the month thereafter. But well, well, some of them, for instance, like the outreach and and, and that's an ongoing. That's going to be an ongoing. Yeah. So um, I think if we can make significant progress on that, that would be great. And even if we can't make, if we, even if we can't wrap up inclusionary zoning, if we make the kind of progress we're talking about, that would be a substantive. Mm -hmm. uh Agreed. you know a, a means of addressing that one and the helping fha is going to be an ongoing one as well so at middle housing we're not going to resolve but but again if we can make some if we can cite some specific progress that we've made and recommendations we've made i think we can pat ourselves on the back a little bit for that i would be happy if we could get inclusionary zoning 20 percent would be good but uh, <laughs> I'd even be happy at 15. Well, 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 Steve, you can show us how to do it. <laughs> with, with with your with your okay. with your analysis of um, the new development spreadsheet. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, then I guess we can move on to our, our regular items. Uh, Mark? Uh, I did provide in your packet, and I'll send this out to Heather and Gwen online, uh, an updated uh, moratorium tracking sheet. Mm -hmm. um, if you see something that doesn't look right, let me know. We are tracking a couple projects that we all intents and purposes might be considered abandoned at this point, but uh, there was a 
tour approval granted. There was some conversation with other wetlands or planning and zoning at one point. So uh, we, we show them as proposed. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we recently talked about uh, 110 Woodrow and Tiffany Katona Drive, uh, two projects that have gone through uh, code review. Um, 110 Woodrow is a small 830G at the end of exit. Uh, I think, right? Yeah, it's South Florida. Between the Indian restaurant. Correct. Yeah, it's that exit. Yeah. Um, and Katona is that office conversion mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. So, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think this is reflective of the projects that are currently out there. Mm -hmm. um, but let me know if you've heard of something else that I may have missed along the way. Mm -hmm. There are 42 developments on the list, 19 of which are HWG. Yeah, I have a completely separate on the tracking sheet on my 830G projects because mm -hmm. we we include those that were denied. You know, I, I think we've uh, I've used this stat before. I think we've had 26 applications under 830G, mm -hmm. uh, the majority of which have been approved mm -hmm. in some form or another. Uh, not all have been built, um, and uh, you know, that's part of it. Um, so. Anyway, that's that's the update. Yeah. Um, do, you have, do you know of any other community that has had half as many A32 developments proposed? I don't know. I don't track them. I would say, you know, what's what's interesting here is that when I look at other applications for a moratorium, it generally takes. Uh, communities and they're small, much smaller communities, but there are like three or four projects, mm -hmm. and they've got, and some of them are quite large. They would be a hundred unit or hundred fifty unit development, and you know a lot of ours are, you know, you got a thirteen unit eight thirty G, a twenty six unit eight thirty G. That's really kind of odd. I think mm -hmm. I, they're they're smaller than normal, um, so. Couple, when we put our application together, it's going to be quite voluminous because it's going to require a lot of projects and developments to actually get to the necessary points. And, um, you know, I've looked at some and they're thick already. You know, I'm thinking like this is going to be a multi <laughs> three ring binder set, you know, binder three out of three type thing. But uh, it is what it is. I don't, but I don't know. 26 is the highest, or mm -hmm. seems high. Yeah, you know, the only other town I really know is Westport. You know, I haven't seen anything like that. They've got a handful of that. Yeah. I think the same place. And it's surprising mm -hmm. that you would think that Fairfield has, it's an excellent town. It's got the two universities, it's got the train stations, it's got the beaches, good schools. But Westport has a lot of that stuff too. And um, you have a higher market rate. The rents they could charge and yeah. the higher income levels. Um, you know, no walk dairy and I don't know. You would think the developers would be looking. I guess they are, but still, twenty six is a lot. Does seem like a lot. Is they approved? Or is there some reason they're not proceeding? Is it still... the approved ones? Um, some some you know were abandoned. Like I just got an inquiry today asking about. Merit 44, which is the plant factory site. So it was originally approved for a 25,000 square foot medical office. Then they came back mm -hmm. with a 100 plus unit affordable housing development under 830G. Okay. And then after they got that approved, they went back to the 25,000 mm -hmm. square foot medical office mm -hmm. building, which the Planning and Zoning Commission said, yes, please, mm -hmm. we'll do that instead. So <laughs> um, that's what's being built up there. There are a couple examples like that. The one on Oldfield was originally an 830G. Uh, there was an 830G on Kings Highway near the train station. Mm -hmm. After he got his approval, he said, well, I can't build this. This these numbers, what, the numbers you gave me. I said, I gave you this numbers all along. I don't understand why it's suddenly a revelation to you that it's expensive. Um, yeah, so there are a couple, we got some folks that go into this and um, as 
like that, they haven't fully crunched the numbers and, until they get the approval. And they say, oh. Masonic Temple got 12 units. That's in that's in litigation. So the one uh, 131 was approved, but approved based on uh, conditions that proved too much for the developer. So he took an appeal and that's where we are. We're in court. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So just quickly, the housing trust fund, I just ran the numbers. And as of uh, the end of uh, September, we have a balance of $913,591 with a reserve of $319,000. So we have an uncommitted balance of $594,500. $594,590. And what is the reserve again? The reserve is for Parkview. No, Commons. I mean, how much? 319. 319, thank you. That's less the yeah. deposit, uh, which we've not actually used. We have a, I'm holding the uh, bank check. It is back on, um, on the docket for a sale next month, so. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Forever. And who's the bank? Wells Fargo. I've not had any success there. I don't know anybody over there either. I, I accused Citibank by mistake and then I <laughs> had to eat my words. So um, they were okay. Uh, nothing, uh, Park, Parkview, were, um, I have to talk to the purchasing agent. I do have an attorney, same attorney that we use for Greenfield Street. So um, we should be move quickly on a development agreement. Jim Scaramoza. Jim Scaramoza. And we'll be presenting to hopefully the Board of Selectmen in November after the election dust mm -hmm. is settled. Um, Greenfield Street under construction. Um, and they are hosting, this will be posted, they're hosting a home buyer informational session on the 28th at the Fairfield Public Library. Anyone interested in learning how they might be an eligible homeowner for the new units, they held a similar session in Bridgeport um, a few weeks back, I believe. So uh, we'll post this. They get a lot of people showing up with these. Um, so we'll post that out. And then I did want to, uh, we run a call today and it was reference made to a um, Fairfield County Talks housing um, program coming up on the 17th. It's in Westport uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Um, it's at the Westport Public Library, and I'll send this out in case anyone would like to. October 17th? And, yes. And it, the conversation includes a panel, which will have uh, House Majority Leader Jason Rojas, Emily Byrne, from Connecticut Voices for Children, and Sabira Gordon from Concan. I don't know her. Um, but, you know, if, you, if you're interested in hearing what their perspective is. It's on the site. I'll send it out. It's they have a red it's free, but they have a registration. Um, um, I think that's it under those items. The only other thing um I saw this and I know you always look for um information, mm -hmm. but talking about the cost of parking and its impact on affordable housing development. And there was a um, white paper done by Rutgers University looking at the cost of parking on rental unit development in New Jersey. And, you know, could there be more opportunities to create more affordable housing, lower cost housing, if we could reduce our parking 
requirements. So I know it's a conversation that we're having. We've talked about the commercial, but the uh, the conversion, the office conversion on, on it's a it's an 18 unit proposed 18 unit development um, on Katona Drive under our existing parking regulations. Uh, multifamily developments of 11 to 20 units um, would set it would be required to set aside three parking spaces per unit, which is kind yeah. of excessive. Mm -hmm. So uh, he did get a variance, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, for some of it, but he did, does need relief uh, from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mm -hmm. But there's not really a whole rationale behind why you would need three parking spaces per unit for larger developments and only two parking spaces for smaller you know I can understand if you have it based on uh, bedroom count you know the size of the unit that way but not the size of the development dictates how many parking spaces you need so there's just a few weird things in our regs like the fees that we talked about maybe if we uh, adjusted them, maybe it'd be easier to, you know, create lower cost housing. Yeah. Mark, you're good. you'll send that out to the committee member? The parking thing, yes. Okay. And also the other things I mentioned too, um, in case you know of anyone who'd like to attend the home buyer session, as well as if you want to go to the Westport meeting, it's there. Great. And I just have one more thing under new business then. Okay. Um, and I apologize, Gwen, Heather, I have a handout, which I can't really provide to you. That's uh, okay, no worries. I'll, I'll share it. Um, it's really, so there was a, well, I'm sorry, this is probably the wrong. For, is that two? Yeah, yeah, for, yeah it is two. Okay. Ignore the tenant which says 78 Uncle Place. This yeah. is not 78 Uncle Place. This is 5545 Park Avenue. So when this is an 830G development uh, being built next to Sacred Heart, when it was first proposed, it was bigger. It was, I think, 120 units. I think it was a floor taller. And during the deliberations of planning and zoning, uh, the developer agreed to a hundred unit development, one floor below. So it's a should be a hundred unit development, um, of which fifteen percent are affordable at or below sixty percent AMI, and fifteen percent are affordable at or below eighty percent AMI. So the developer, after it got approved, sold it to another entity that's actually building the project and will manage it. And they're a responsible party. And they had uh, approached the town and said, look, the affordability plan that's on file is um, reflects this original project. So that is not, you know, they reached out to me and asked what the current rent uh, limits are. And um, so they have provided a revised affordability plan, uh, which is reflected the project being built. And as part of that, they provided dispersal. Uh, analysis, they provided a set of floor plans, and they said, this is how we think the unit should be dispersed. And so I, I looked at it, and I, I think it's pretty good. Um, I, I don't get too excited. I looked at just the size of the units, um, which I think are fairly comparable. But, you know, again, in terms of the allocation amongst floors, different size units, what happens over time is if somebody goes beyond income, if they they go over income, they become a market rate unit, the next unit becomes an affordable unit. So they, they kind of change over time. What is important is the distribution of the unit types. So when I look at it, they have, they're proposing three studios at or below 60% AMI, two studios at or below 80% AMI, um, seven each on one bedrooms between the 60 and 80% threshold. And then in the two bedrooms, five uh, affordable to households at or below 60% and 
and six had a below 80% AMI. If it all adds up, 15, 15, you know, I do 100, 15% is 15, 30% uh, overall. Um, the only question I have, and the only suggestion I said to planning and zoning was whether they should uh, provide instead of three studios out of below 60 it should be so two studios out of below 60 three at 80 six studio uh, six two bedrooms out of below 60 and five at 80. Um, can I ask a question? How it still far? produces 15 units in the same distribution mix, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the two bedrooms would be more valuable to us right. and obviously yeah. to them yeah. as well. Yeah. So that would be the only comment. Um, I think they would probably do that you know, if we asked. Uh, but Jim had reached out and said, do you have any comments in their proposed revised affordability plan? understand they talked to you as well as their proposed dispersal analysis. And I said, well, since we're having an affordable housing committee, I will share my analysis with the members and see what they do. But I, I didn't, didn't give you the whole plan, pretty boilerplate, but, and I know this is hot, hard to look at. I just How tall is the building? It's um, five stories, I think it's 401. Mm -hmm. Five floors with parking and park energy. Yeah. yeah. And so the number did this um is there any way of telling what floor these units are on? Yeah. I have it by floor one, two, three, four, and five. So you can see their distribution. Oh, so okay. there are there are five properties, but I think they have partial on that uh fifth floor. I mean smaller smaller number of units the Two, three, four, obviously bigger floor plates. Um, so are all of the studios on the first floor? Um, no, they are not. I didn't do that level of analysis. But they're they're pretty well distributed. All right. Oh, I could just I couldn't tell if they were. Yeah, I'm, well. yeah. I do have. Yeah. Want to look at yeah. Yeah. this whole thing? So you know, okay. so they're all pretty well distributed. They have. A certain number of ADA compliant units to, I mean, it, it It looked pretty good. The only question I guess I had was we want to ask them to give us an extra, you know, give us a two bedroom at 60, an extra two bedroom in lieu of the studio. Well, I, for one, would leave it to your discretion. Okay. I, I agree with you. I think that it would benefit family, right? All right. Imagine a family as opposed to like a single. And we would get more credit, more points. We won, actually. No. 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 It's not based on it's uh it's only based on um this is considered multifamily mm -hmm. rental. Mm -hmm. And then it's based on 60, 80, it's 80, 60, and 40. So it's one point for for uh 80 and one. Yeah, if you look at the more score, I give you yeah. the Point. It begins with a breakdown over here. And so, and, and there's no, there's no differentiation between the two bedrooms Family and the... Units. Yeah. Yeah, that's, just, that's strange. You would think... Um, they used to give a bonus point for uh, three bedroom units, but that sunset. Yeah. Uh, well, I think just in general, it would benefit a family better. It'd be more likely that a family right? would use a two bedroom versus a studio, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you able to get 30%? How are they able to? I mean, how did, you know, was in the requirements, you know, 12%, 12.5%? Oh, because this is an 830G, so they have to do 30%. <laughs> this is totally outside of our zoning regulations. I mean, it's not a bad location for it. It's next to Sacred Heart. It's off the yeah, Mayor yeah. Parkway. Um, you know, so it's okay. Okay. Uh, anything else? <laughs> anything else? Uh, I have a couple of things or questions. Um, at, at the loss, Mark, the um, parking, do you have to pay for parking? Yes. And 
Do the people in the affordable units have to pay for parking? I believe they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so does that affect the rent? I remember if it's or I have to go back and double check, but I I don't think parking is considered a housing amenity. I think that is extra. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have to net that out. You mm -hmm. have to double check. Okay. Um, and there are the three bedroom units are they say the market rate is seven thousand. Yeah. Are they getting that? I don't think so. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I did a survey back in March. Mm -hmm. And um, vacancy rates for uh, these types of larger multifamily developments overall were was pretty low. It was like three percent mm -hmm. overall, three percent. This mm -hmm. within this development, mm -hmm. the it was um, fifty percent of the three bedroom were vacant. Mm -hmm. So there are six units, three of which were vacant. Um, if you take the affordable three bedroom out of it, it means three of the five market rate units were vacant. And I think they were just overpriced. I mean, you think about it, that's a lot of money and you can go buy a house or rent the house, uh, which has three or four bedrooms for that amount of money. So um, I don't know. I think they had to come down on their price for the three. I don't know what they ended up. I just checked. They're all rented at this point. So I believe they did lower their Price. So the three bedroom. I talked to the property manager about it. Uh, affordable are really affordable. Yes, they are. Fifteen hundred, fourteen hundred dollars. For a three bedroom. For a three bedroom. bedroom. Yeah. 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 That's why you know I don't think you're going to see too many people put three bedrooms. It, he partly I don't know you're going to see too many people put three bedrooms. It, it's great if you can get that money for them. Yeah. Um, then maybe it's worthwhile, but. Yeah. The fact that he struggled to rent them out, and that was pretty well known, mm -hmm. uh, and probably had to reduce his cost or his price. I don't, I think two bedrooms probably are a limit for a lot of these developments. Because mm -hmm. he can just three bedroom, four bedroom, that's a housing type that exists. It's just in a single family unit, and there's plenty of those for rent around, a surprising number, actually. Makes so. you ever think in college students? I don't always think. I think he just tested the market. Yeah. He had a small number. And maybe yeah. Good for him. The hot rate for one bedroom at Parish Court is seventeen twenty-five. Yeah. Um, I sent you a couple of you anyway. The, um, the multi-family houses that have sold this year. I'm glad you revised your analysis on the other one. And so it's like, wow, we're doing well on the sales. <laughs> so the, the interesting thing on the, the multifamily is that um, there were 20, and uh, nine out of the 20 sold for more than the listing price, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I, I did not send this all the way around me you now, yet, and oh. Heather, I will, but there was a um, housing stats. Um, I kind of summarized sales and, and what's currently listed for sale. Um, and to me, the most interesting thing is that uh, we've got 69 houses listed for sale. None of them are listed at 300,000 or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the median list price is a million seven. How many? Uh, I'm sorry. How many are are, on, are listed? Um, sixty nine. Sixty nine. And and so out of that sixty nine, thirty seven of the houses, the asking price is more than a million. Mm -hmm. Only 22 are less than a million. And none are less than 300. Sorry? None are less than 300. None are less than 300. I mean, if we looked at the number that were sold in the last year, would we find any that were less than 300? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this year, um, two were below 300. Probably condos. or, or uh, No, five condos. You know, two houses. And you know, generally they're 
It could be teardowns. Yeah, basically, you know, they're small or even odd place or just really dilapidated. Yeah. So one one other thing, so just their thoughts on the situation, and I, I won't use the address or names, but we have a, a homeowner actually owns a two family. Um, he acquired it uh, from his mother's estate. Uh, the two siblings own the property. Um, one of them lives on the premises with his wife. Um, for whatever reason, they are significantly behind their taxes. Um, I think total taxes, interest, and lien fees are um, upwards of sixty thousand uh, dollars money that they don't have, and they really you know, this went around the horn. Um, you know, any department that can assist is there a mechanism by which we can help? And really, you know, the so the tax collector and they continue to accrue interest. Mm -hmm. Until it's until and there's no mechanism, you know, he can't waive it, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and the I just said, well, you know, this is a two family, and you know, what if the town were to acquire, uh, take an option to purchase mm -hmm. the property, give him money now, uh, assuming that he might be able to keep the taxes current if we just got him up, up to speed. And we could then, when he goes to sell, we'd be in a position to buy it um, and use it for affordable housing. Um, what about that idea? Could we do that? I, you know, I got a, that's an interesting thought, but I don't know where uh, that money would come from unless it came from the housing trust fund. It's, a, again, an option would require, again, you're taking so I'd still have to go through all these town boards to take an option on a piece of property, I think. I would have to get Board of Selectmen, Planning and Zoning, RTM approval. Obviously, you would have to authorize the use of the funds. I just, I'm just trying to figure out a way to help the guy you know, keep it, stay in his house. Is he an um, older guy? Seems older and has some health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, he and his wife. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm just... Yeah, I'm looking at the property. We're thinking about, you know, how do we buy property in town, keep it affordable? And here's a circumstance where we can look at blighted properties or property that might be on the market. But once it gets out there, you know, people swoop in and they buy it for 600 because they can sell for uh, build uh, two, you know, two million dollar houses side by side. You don't care what you pay for the land. Um, if you're trying to do a duplex that sells for two hundred thousand, it kind of reduces what you can afford to pay on the piece of property. So, so the, the lot is the two family lot. It's a two family, yeah. The house is not a two family. I think it is a legal two family. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I was just spitballing ideas like yeah. I usually do. You could buy it now. Give life use. Yeah. Another thought that I had as well. It's another property that's very similar to that where they're constantly the social services, they're in all the time. They they don't have an income, they're on disability, they can't afford the upkeep of the house, let alone the rent. We've fixed up, replaced the roof because the roof was collapsing and they live there. Um but it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a two two family lot in a in the beach area. Well, are there any precedents we have to worry about setting or? I, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's great. I'm just throwing ideas I think it's out. Great that you're looking at this. I'm just wondering how many other people might be in similar situations that we. And if they weren't, would that be such a them. bad thing, you know? But no, I'm not suggesting at all, but I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, we're, we're. I mean, subject to. I mean, maybe it's a real funding. Maybe, maybe it's a real, maybe it's a real win-win opportunity. I don't know. But you're looking for you're op, you're taking an option. You're not buying. You're taking advantage of it for free. You're gonna pay 
the market value of some things. You just have that option. So you can set a price now, as you said, buy it now, give them a, it's kind of like a reverse mortgage almost. You, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You give them the cash up front and you, you give them life use of the property. Just I mean, something to look into. And yeah. Look I don't know. I don't know what the mechanics yeah, are. Like, yeah. But you do, I, I manage a, a house in Westport where we bought it and uh, she has a life estate. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not crazy about the housing, the management of the house part. Right, because then you've got to do the roof and you've got to do yep. the refrigerator. Oh, yeah. yep. yeah. We're well, not the housing authority. Yeah. So that's, you know, actually, we're talking to Carol about management. Mm -hmm. It's four of us. Mm -hmm. You just want to buy a property down in Southport. Uh, Carol buy it. So mm -hmm. She's the housing authority, that's what they do. They manage property. So mm -hmm. they don't want to be. Yeah, no. I don't want to be the housing authority. No. Anything new on St. Emory? No. Mm -hmm. You can talk to the Finley House. Didn't we have a contact over there? But yeah, Bob it? yeah. Somebody Bob the bishop or something. No, it was yeah. it was um well we had identified who their housing person was, the arch mm -hmm. the arch the diocese is housing yeah. person. Yeah. And uh, didn't you find out that there was that they weren't anxious to do anything? Well, that's that pretty much sums up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, did, didn't you have some communication with that? Uh, the last play we're going to do was, uh, I think the first select one was going to reach out. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but they do have a housing, or they do have a real estate yeah. person. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I, I think that's I've talked to a bunch of churches about the property. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you know, there's less and less people going to church. Mm -hmm. Saint Timothy. The diocese mm -hmm. only can land on the village. Yeah. 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 Um, well, they're yeah, talking to the St. Paul about joining. Oh, I didn't know that. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, they still has to be a lot. Of but they're find it. Okay. And that's it. Really, really. And there's yeah. that property across from you. Yeah. There are a few Jews. That that's why I'm conscious. Every time yeah. I drive past it, yeah. three times yeah. a day, yeah. I look at it. And, wow. And, is it a thriving nursery school? Okay. Are, anything else then for uh, the meeting? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, are, are, we, are we good yeah. to, good to adjourn? Oh, wait, you know, before we adjourn, this is Heather. Um, I believe next month, the November meeting is my last meeting as my term is up. Well, you can, you get to continue to serve until a replacement has been appointed. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure the rules and regs around that. And I'm certainly happy to, to do that. But I did want to make mention of it that I know that my term is up this November. I think Steve may be in the same boat. Yeah. Thank you and Steve. Uh, yep. And I'm happy to con I'm happy to continue until a um, replacement is found. Okay. But I just wanted to at least make mention of it. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Heather. Um, I don't know if I qualify. I don't know if you can be reappointed. Yeah. Yeah. No, not. It's okay. If I can, fine. Mm -hmm. I will see you as an interested observer, just like Jack. That's right. <laughs> All right, we're adjourned. I think we're I think we're adjourned. Okay, Th thank you, everyone. Uh, adjourned at nine oh two. Thanks, thanks, Kevin yeah. and Heather. Yeah.